Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the LSE and uh, welcome to this Forum for European Philosophy discussion on religion and the market. Are they in conflict? Uh, we've got two great speakers tonight and I don't want to hold you up too long, but I am struck by a very odd, perhaps almost inexplicable presence in our midst, in our societies today of a... Um, of some kind of odd tension between two seemingly indisputable facts. One is that there seems to be, or, or for many people, it, it, they would say there is a particularly aggressive secularism gaining ground in Western societies today. And on the other hand, people will say that we're living in a soci society which is seeing an unexpected revival of religion gaining ground in Western societies. Now, that's a very curious combination. Uh, it'll take some sorting out to see whether both could be true. But we have with us today two people who've been thinking very hard about these relationships between Western secularity, secularism, and the so-called revival of religion. One. John Micklethwaite is the editor of The Economist, and with Adrian Woolridge is the author of God is Back, How the Global Rise in Faith is Changing the World. And one of the central arguments in that, that I know that John Gray will want to pull up, take, take a look at shortly, is the idea that a certain kind of American form of secularity and Christianity is gaining ground in Western societies. If John Micklethwaite's thesis at some level is that God is back, John Gray is perhaps best known for arguing that really he never went away, that the forms of secularity that we see in Western societies are rooted in, and perhaps a hangover of, Christian faith and Christian forms of understanding the world and the significance of our lives. So these two have an opportunity this evening to uh, dispute these interpretations of our contemporary situation. Um, John Gray is going to go first. John Gray, who is uh, Emeritus Professor of European Thought here at the LSE, was in the European Institute where I'm located. Uh, latterly, he was in the government department. Um, he's well known for his book, Straw Dogs and Black Mass, but he's also recently published uh, Grey's Anatomy. Now, both of the books that I've mentioned now are on sale outside. I hope some of you may have got them already, but you'll have a chance to get them at the end. And they, indeed, the authors will be happy to sign them here. I'll mention that again at the end. But, uh, so afterwards, if you go out and buy the book, you come back, you'll find that they're still here. Um, what we're going to do now, uh, John Gray's going to go first and make a few remarks about um, John Micklethwaite's book. Uh, then John Micklethwaite will have a right to reply, and then they're going to go into some kind of dialogue discussion about that, and I'll chivvy them along if needs be. And then with about uh, 35 minutes to go towards the end, uh, we hope that you'll have an opportunity to participate too with your own questions and observations. And I think there will be microphones going around. I can't see anybody at the moment, but there normally are. Uh, anyway, so first of all, um, John Gray, you're going to talk about John's book. Thank you. Can you all hear? Is I, am I um, audible? Well, I'd like to begin by saying um, it's a very important book um, for a number of reasons. And one reason is uh, that it tracks a development in the real world an actually strong series of historical developments in various parts of the world, which I think has um, perhaps not, perhaps to say it's gone unnoticed in social science would be uh, an exaggeration, but whose importance has not been, whose significance, whose meaning, sorry, whose meaning has not been fully grasped in social science, because it seems to me that with only one or two significant exceptions, 20th century and early 21st century social scientific theorizing has been dominated by a model of uh, 
uh, secularization, uh, which um, has never been really um, empirically or theoretically ad adequate or satisfactory, but which has been long since falsified. Um, the roots of social sciences practiced today, and particularly the more theoretical parts of it, go back to the 19th century in thinkers like Marx, Mill, and Comte, but also, of course, Weber and Durkheim later on, all of whom in one way or another, and with different degrees of um, qualification, did hold to a thesis of secularization. Let's put out on one side immediately boring and tedious questions about historical inevitability. Uh, the question as to whether this process of secularization was inevitable, I don't think any of these thinkers said it was inevitable. What they held was that there were certain deep forces bound up with modernity, bound up with the modern period, which would over time with various lags and, 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 and uh, sideways movements and regressions and so forth, produce a situation most likely in which um, religion ceased to be uh, a central factor in um, war and political conflict, and if it survived at all, would become primarily associational or even private. That's what Marx thought. That's what Mill thought with a qualification which I'll mention in a moment. That's what um, Herbert Spencer thought. That's what all these 19th century thinkers thought, or most of them, nearly all of them. And I think that assumption or that, that model went on right into the um, uh, 20th century and has really gone on ever since. So the background, uh, if you like, the default position of um, the higher reaches of social science, the theoretical reaches, has been a thesis of secularization, which I think never stood up. In the first place, it, it, most of its evidences were restricted to parts of Western Europe to a few countries. It never really fitted America. Uh, certainly by the time um, um, Alex de Tocqueville went there, it was clear that America was a very religious country, maybe more than when it was first started even, a point which um, John makes in his, in his book. It hasn't since then become significantly less religious on almost any um, a definition of what it means to be religious, religious or, or, or any understanding of the influence or power of religion. The exception I want to mention, I don't want to miss out, is that in the 19th century, of course, Comte and the positivists didn't deny the need for a religion. They were actually, to some extent, um, in modern times, they were actually, to some extent, I think, more astute than other thinkers in that respect. But they wanted traditional religions to be replaced by what they called the religion of humanity, uh, which was a... Uh, um, uh, a term Mill took over from Comte. That's to say, transcendental or supernatural religions, they were thinking of religions, nearly everyone still does actually, in the context of Western monotheism. Non-theistic religions, like Buddhism, hardly ever got a look in. Um, but they wanted what they called religion, essentially Western monotheism, to be replaced by a religion of humanity in which the supreme being became um, the human species. And that hasn't happened either. Um, the only f sociologist I can think of of any significance and importance, a, a major theorist who's questioned this thesis of secularization was Peter Berger, who was a strong advocate of secularization as a theoretical position for a long time, and um, then uh, um, changed his mind, I think, quite rightly. So my first point is that this is a very important book because it challenges a, uh, um, uh, um, a default position in social science by looking at what's actually happening in the world and what's actually happening in the world is that in the parts of the world where modernization by other conceptions of what modernization is is most rapid and profound it's secular belief systems that are declining and religion which is getting stronger and there are some very interesting narratives and uh, facts and figures and so forth in the book that I about China and other parts of the world that I suggest you consult now I want to make a uh, uh, um, a distinction here which is important which arises from something that our chair, chair said earlier on about aggressive secularism and commented on the seeming paradox that we live in a period where um, secularization seems to be faltering but aggressive secularism is um, are getting stronger at least in the media. I don't think this is a deep paradox. I think it's um, almost natural. 
That's to say, um, if you think that, if you start, as many people do, uh, from the assumption that uh, some deep forces of modernity are marginalizing religion, and it turns out that this is not the case in many parts of the world, then you'll, a natural response would be to demand a kind of fairly aggressive form of secularism. Now, of course, secularism as a, is a political doctrine which has nothing to do either logically or even historically with um, secularization as a theory in social science. In the first place, most of the secular constitutions, of certainly American secularism, was not an anti-religious or an agnostic or a skeptical or an atheist position. It was one which grew out of dissenting religion. In other words, um, the people who demanded a secular constitution in the United States and elsewhere were not religious unbelievers. <coughs> they were nearly all believers. Uh, but for various reasons to do with persecution in England and other parts of Europe, um, they wanted a, some kind of war between church and state, at least at the federal um, level. So I take the reemergence of secularism, aggressive secularism, arguing that not just the state, but maybe all public institutions, including education, should be denuded of religious influences and stripped of um, any religious role. I take that as actually a response to the failure of secularization. They are connected dialectically, if I can use a very old-fashioned word. Uh, um, one comes from the other, because that's the pe uh, people who who've held to secularization a as a thesis Mo nowadays, many of them, most of the, the people who hold to secularization as a thesis are religious unbelievers, are hostile to religion, want to see it die out and be replaced by something else, and that's not what's happened. What's happened instead is that the big se secular belief systems, communism before that and after, have collapsed pretty well completely in most parts of the world. There are some redoubts, there are Maoists in Nepal, Peru, uh, um, uh, et cetera, neo-Nazis here, here and there, uh, unfortunately coming back a bit now, even more unfortunately. But the major secular um, 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 uh, ideologies that were so strong in the 20th century when, for example, communist parties had millions and millions of um, uh, members in Western Europe when they were, where they weren't forced to become members as they were in the former Soviet bloc, that's over, that's gone, and I don't think it's coming back. So the main secular projects, if you like, political projects animated by belief systems, so most of them have grown considerably weaker, while on the other hand, religion has either remained strong or become stronger. And that's, I think, the, the context in which um, um, aggressive secularism has reemerged as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a response to the retreat of secularization. Um, I don't want to take too long, so I'll be quite brief now. A couple of other things. I mean, the, the core of the book, the theoretical core, is the observation, and I think it is an observation, rather than a, a theoretical stance that the authors adopted before they wrote the book. It's the observation that um, uh, religion and modernization are, are not related in the way that the theory I mentioned earlier suggested. That, as I said earlier, that in many parts of the world where modernization is occurring most rapidly, that's to say phenomena like literacy, economic growth, uh, development of middle classes, increasing prosperity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, where this is happening most rapidly, it's not associated with um, rapid declines in religious belief and activity, but on the contrary. And of course, in those parts of the world where religion was suppressed for decades or generations, like in the Soviet Union, the end point of that experiment has not been that religion has disappeared or that even that it's become marginal. Um, it continues to be uh, uh, important and to some extent there is even a religious revival. And that leads me to my critical response to the book, which is that it seems to me that although secularization is retreating in many parts of the world, um, there are one or two places, by the way, which are becoming more secular. Um, um, Ireland is an obvious example, pretty rapid transformation to do with increased prosperity and also issues within the Catholic Church connected with um, unpunished and un recorded or even actively suppressed pedophile abuse. Um, uh, there are one or two areas of the world. So I'm not saying there's a, a universal tendency to desecularization. And as also, was also mentioned earlier on, um, I think to some extent the um, secular period, uh, this might sound paradoxical. I don't want to introduce yet a further paradox, but I think these are not real paradoxes. They're actually related phenomena in the world. The period of when, the, when there seemed to be uh, extensive secularization in the 20th century 
was somewhat um, delusive or deceptive in that although religious beliefs, particularly those of Christianity, were actively rejected by um, uh, strong secular projects such as communism and even a large part of the Nazis too, various patterns of thinking had been inherited from Christianity, which continued. Uh, patterns of thinking about the relations of humans to their natural environment, the nature of human history, uh, conquest of nature, uh, redemption in history, and so on. And this is a rather important point because it's very common among critics of religion to imagine that if you reject religious beliefs, you've gotten rid of religion as a, an intellectual phenomenon. But the structures of thought can remain, even if the beliefs are rejected or inverted. But my main criticism of the book, I, I don't think it's sort of that fundamental compared with the importance of the book, but it is a criticism, is that um, uh, the authors argue that uh, a particular model of religion is spreading, namely uh, an American model in which um, religion is friendly to um, the market, and friendly also, I think they want to say, to certain types of values of individualism and of pluralism. And that view I don't share. That's to say, it seems to me that uh, the comeback of religion, not only did religion not go away completely because certain aspects of the secular period were really um, shaped by um, Christianity in particular, but with the beliefs suppressed or inverted. Um, but um, uh, the retreat of secularization has different forms and different embodiments in different parts of the world. So in parts of the world, it's connected with nationalism say that's true to some extent in Russia and in India. Um, uh, uh, even when it's closely connected with business activity, when you can actually have a kind of corporate model of religion, um, it needn't be associated with, it, with values of individualism or pluralism. And some of the Japanese cults, very much organized as businesses, maybe exemplify that point. So it seems to me that although one can observe a general um, um, phenomenon of in which uh, secularization is either not advancing or is retreating, general but not universal, because the whole idea that there should be a kind of universal law in this respect, I think, is a, a mistake. Although that is true, there isn't any single model which I think is becoming dominant. And the argument that there is a dominant model of religion, which is, so to speak, American, is rather like the argument that, in fact, it's related to the argument of Thomas Friedman and others, that um, as capitalism spreads, it'll be the American type that um, becomes predominant. I think there can be many varieties of capitalism. There are many varieties of capitalism. And not only is it not true that all the others will be driven out by the American model, it's not even true that the American model will be, or even is now, predominant of capitalism. And the same thing, I think, is true of religion, except that I don't think the American model of religion has ever been predominant, except in America and one or two other um, um, countries. So that's my main um, criticism, but the, so, uh, the conclusion, I think, which the authors reach um, is one I strongly endorse, <coughs> which is that there's really no rational ground for believing that religion will cease to shape human affairs, including war and conflict, in the future as it has in the past. In fact, um, the view that um, religion will be marginalized, either disappear altogether, or become vestigial, or become part of private life, like a hobby or a type of cuisine. Uh, um, I think that view is um, uh, an article of faith. It's not a conclusion of rational inquiry. It's simply part of a secular religion. Right, there we go. Um, so one from one John to another. I, I, Part reply, I think, part uh, introduction of your own ideas. Well, well thank you. I'm, I'm in that unique position of, of having been defined already by John Gray, which is a, which is a huge <laughs> privilege on the whole compared with, compared with most people. And I think my only, uh, my general point, because we agreed very much that John would, John would set the tone and then start pestering me with questions about it, um, is I think, when I think of John, I think of him as a great public intellectual. And I think he's both raised our book to to great heights, and, but to some extent may have taken it one stage too far to the extent that when we wrote it, um, we do deal um, with the intellectual case to do with modernity and religion. That's, that's right at the very heart of it. And we do 
from our perspective, if you look at the history of Western thought, what eventually happens is when thinkers think things, they eventually filter back through to actions. But I think in general, when we think of what we were battling against, it was partly that, that huge Western intellectual tradition in which you know, we were very much educated. I went to a Catholic school, but still I think within that environment, the general assumption was that actually the world, obviously for worse from the point of view of the monks, was, 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 gradually, getting, um, was gradually getting more secular and was likely to do so. And certainly um, Adrian, my co-author, who's not here, who's an atheist, he would strongly have taken that view. And that, that, that was the world in which we came in. I think in some ways, John might almost be too kind to some Western intellectuals. My memory of Freud was that he was far ruder about religion rather than just viewing it as a sort of distant edge. He viewed it as a sort of cruel hypnosis, I think, taken on by people who, 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 didn't, um, who couldn't appreciate sex. Um, <laughs> but in terms of where we were coming from, I mean, yes, we were bred in that tradition. But fundamentally, also, there was a basic journalistic edge to this because I think these thoughts, which do, I think, very much in Western Europe go all the way back to the Enlightenment, um, e even on the basic issue about how you set up a church, whether an established church is a good or bad idea. There's a very good dispute between David Hume and Adam Smith, where Smith is, um, um, basically says, look at it, it's, it's absurd. The, um, you'll never, ever succeed in terms of bringing in souls. And I'm thinking here particularly about the theme of religion and the market today. You'll never bring in souls um, if you have an established clergy, because that'd be far too lazy. And Hume is furious, livid about this, because he hated religion. And so he was very cross about Smith telling people this and, and, and somehow spreading the word that established clergy might be a bad idea. Um, I apologize to all the people in dog collars in the audience. Uh, the, 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 so, so it sat there at the beginning, that these, these big thinkers. But fundamentally, what we were reacting to was partly that intellectual tradition in which we were born on. But it was also actually basic politics and journalistic life today, because it isn't just a question of great minds and public intellectuals thinking about it. I think it goes much deeper than that. The politicians who took that presumption, even people who are quite religious themselves, it did have practical consequences. You know, if you were, just to look at foreign policy, if you were the CIA in 1970s and somebody produced a paper about the rise of um, or the problems facing the Shah at the time, and if somebody dared to produce a paper saying that it may have something to do with religion, and it was immediately dismissed as mere sociology, then I think that shows consequences. The American foreign policy towards Lebanon was skewed for a long time because when they looked at Hezbollah, they tried to see it repeatedly in terms of left or right when the translation of the name, the party of God, might have given them some inkling <laughs> that it was deeper than that. And I think the other thing about it is I think to, 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 to the to people now, and this is one of the kind of joys of, of, the, of, of what seems to be happening now, people now are beginning to anticipate that things actually weren't quite that way. But you know, as late as the 1990s, there's a, there's a wonderful anecdote from Madeleine Albright in, I think, a State Department or Cabinet meeting where she sits there and somebody says, with utter surprise and contempt at the other end of the table, you know, isn't it, isn't, they were discussing Northern Ireland, isn't, isn't it amazing that at the end of the 20th century, we're still discussing some religious dispute. At the time, the whole psychology, I think, of all, and this has been the repeated thing, just as journalistically, we felt the whole psychology is not just a matter of intellectuals. It filters down into the people who actually do things. The psychology of the State Department, I think pretty much even under Bush, I would add this as well, was that religion was something which in the end would filter away to the side. And even after 2000, uh, September 11th, I think that element still kept there. Um, it's, I think a lot of the Bush problems in Iraq, obviously not all of them, were caused, I think, in part because people didn't understand or indeed inter interpret the difference between Sunnis and Shias. For a group of people who were such a, a group of God-botherers themselves, they showed very little interest in that sort of thing. And I think, to some extent, we bought it. Um, in our previous book, The Right Nation, I, I wouldn't push this kind of self-contradiction too far, but when we looked at America, one of the arguments of the right nation was that America was a conservative place and it was fundamentally different from the rest of the world on a whole variety of scores. But one of them actually was faith. And, we, and, and when we thought about the rest of the world, I think in retrospect, we were thinking sometime, somewhere in terms of West Europe because there's no doubt in Western Europe, 
on the whole, the Western Europe has been getting gradually more secular throughout this period and is possibly likely to for a little bit longer, maybe not. But whatever, whatever, whatever definition of how secular you think the world is, Western Europe has not been going in that direction. And so from our point of view, yes, there was this big intellectual argument which John's described, but I think there was also just the basic act of journalism where you, you, you see a big idea and then you go out and look around the world and the evidence comes back remarkably quickly to you that this just doesn't make sense, that it is not true that wherever you look around the world, as places have got dramatically more modern. They have not shed religion. They've done it in Western Europe, but pretty much outside. Um, I got reminded yesterday on the phone from Australia, but Australia also is part of Western Europe. Um, the, 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 but with one or two exceptions, and we, we can argue about what happened in Japan and different places, but, but generally, the world has got, or at least at the very least, it has not got progressively more secular, and the big numbers tend to show more people joining the big faiths of, of all different sorts. And so you have that basic, that was my, my sort of first reaction to John's point, is that that was where we came from rather than, than, than just the public, public intellectual side. Although I think what is very clear, and we spend a couple of chapters discussing it, you know, a whole variety of things grabbed the public attention, including actually culture. I think it was interesting that when sort of Victor Hugo died, particularly the, 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 the 19th century is an element where people of culture were treated in a near sort of reverential, near deified way in, in w w ways in which have gone past. So that would be my first reaction. The, the second reaction would be to say that the, the, the argument of God is back, and this comes into the difference between secularism and secularization, the argument, argument of God is back is basically saying, look, two things have happened. One, God is back in terms of personal faith, whether we like it or not, again, outside Western Europe. And then the second question is, God is back, whether we like him or not, in politics. And that, I think, is, again, quite an important change. Because if you look back, I think, in retrospect to the 1970s, you do see, I think, that something rather fundamental went on there, which wasn't just to do with, with, with the mind. It was also to do with the, the, what was happening on the ground. That was the time when you had the Iranian Revolution. That was the time when you had um, uh, the, pretty much the birth of the religious right in America, certainly the foundation of the moral majority. You had the accession of Jimmy Carter at that time, the first born-again um, president of America. You had the BJP graining ground in India. You had a variety of things all the way around the world, including John Paul II. And those were all the things which, in retrospect, there was, there was some kind of change. And now, whether we like it or not, God is back is very much back true of politics. In terms of the European debate, we don't try to claim in this book that Europe is turning um, religious in a big way. I think there is a possibility that Europe will become more religious, um, not as religious as America, but more so. And I think that's partly a function of the same kind of forces that have been at work in the American suburbs beginning to work into European ones. I think, for what it's worth, that Barack Obama is a crucial figure in all this. I think Barack Obama's version of American Christianity will be considerably more easy to sell to European audiences than um, George Bush's one. We tend to think of George Bush as this man who, who, who hit the bottle and then um, was forced into this particularly bloodstained version of religion in some people's guise. Obama's version, which is, could be any one of the younger people in this room, a clever, sophisticated person um, who has done well, who's been through Harvard, and who still thinks there is something missing in his life and finds that in a Chicago church. I think that is, that, that, that sort of image will be a much easier one to sell. So in terms of European spirituality, we don't see a massive reversal, but I, can't, I would imagine it will come back a bit. In terms of politics, of God coming back into European politics, there I do see a bigger amount. And actually, to some extent, when I, when I was thinking, when John was talking about secularization and secularism, if you take Dawkins and Hitchens as the modern um, uh, sort of descendants of part of that, I see that in part as yet more affirmation that what we're basically saying is right. You do not sit down and write a book like Christopher Hitchens did or Richard Dawkins do if you thought secularization was happening, because there'd be absolutely no need to whatsoever. Um, if you think that God is gradually going to disappear, there's absolutely no need to write a book saying that he's a poisonous 
sold and shouldn't be allowed back in in any single way. And that, I think, from that point of view, I think if you look at secularism, there is a strong element of reaction within that against what, what is happening, either conscious or conscious. On the, the last point to do with America, which I, you know, I think is John's, as he says, his sort of biggest criticism, if I can find my correct um, notes here. I, yes, um, in, in, in the book, we, we sat there and tried to work out whether we should cover every religion around the world um, or in, in every particular bit. And we do try to visit most bits from you know, house churches in China to exorcisms in, in, in Brazil to mega temples in, in India and so on. But there is a bias in the book towards Christianity, and there is a bias towards the American version of Christianity. Um, and the reason for that, and from the having to go see Catholics every now and again, I have to try and explain to them to this at rather pained levels, um, is simply we think that is where the element of the debate to do with the religion and modernity is fiercest, where it is at the fore. And in general, actually, I, I, I would still push that, I think, on two levels. Firstly, I think Christianity, more than the other big faiths, or certainly more than Islam, has come to grips with modernity in a much bigger way than Islam certainly has. I, I hope we can have discuss this later, but I hold that hopes for Islam in, in many areas. But it it's patently has not been through the same sort of arguments and testing bits what people call the acids of modernity as much as Christianity. On the issue of the American model, I think if you look around different bits of the world, I think on the whole the American model, I, I agree with the exceptions which John cited, I think you can spot bits of it coming to the fore in two ways. I think if you go to places like China where the book begins and you visit a house church, um, house church is an amazing thing where you get 25 people gathered in a room um, in a house, rather obviously from the, from the name, and the Chinese government has hit on this unique version of spreading religion. I think the first people to hit on this since the ancient Romans who had similar effects on Christianity, which is to set a limit of the number of people who can meet in a particular place. And the result is that whenever a house church reaches about 24 or 25, um, it divides into two. And so it keeps on growing at enormous rates. And our views on the numbers within China is that they're probably somewhere between 70 to 100 million to give you some idea of a, of, a, of a number by contrast, the number of Christians in China is that the number of members of the Communist Party is only about 70 million. And again, what we see in terms of God coming back is on the one hand, you see personal faith, but you see pretty immediate big political problems that follow from that. Now, if you have faith coming back in China, if China is on track, which I, I think is close to being a certainty, to being the world's biggest Christian country, then that is a real problem if you're running the people running China. Again, being journalistic, you go and see the government. They have very, very split views. One half of them welcomes this from the point of view of this is glue which will bind their society together. The other half is deeply frightened. They worry about what John Paul II, as they saw, did, it, did the Soviet Union. They worry about um, the fact that house churches are now close to being the big, biggest NGOs in China. They worry about what the Falun Gong did. They worry about um, the previous revolutions led by Christians. So for all those reasons, I do think that you, 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 so the bit behind this is you do see an American model. What, what you see in terms of Christianity in, in, in China is you see Christianity being spread, yes, by Chinese, but essentially by Chinese who are drawing quite heavily on Korean missionaries originally, but also quite heavily on American missionaries, and the Koreans were converted by the Americans. So in places like that, places like Latin America, I think you see the whole of Latin America being upset by the arrival of evangelical American religion. Fundamentally, why do I push America, which goes back to John's final criticism, is because I think in the end, for two reasons. One, I think, and I, there are very obvious glaring exceptions to this, like Saudi Arabia or Iran. On the whole, there is a general, and I wouldn't, it's a, it's a question of meaning on this, there is a general drift, I think, towards something closer to a pluralism, a pluralistic society. Not everywhere. But even if you go to places where people remain fairly monotheist, or they, sorry, they remain fairly stuck to one particular religion, the option, having the option of being able to go to more, I think that is fundamental in the end what the American religious model is about. So when you think about the American religious um, experience spreading, I don't see that necessarily as Billy Graham conquering the world. I see it as a gradual move, and in many ways I would argue in this point, desirable. Our book is not, does not, does not give short shrift to the many unpleasant things which come with religion in different bits of the world. 
But the desirable aspect, I think, is this element of pluralism, this element of choice, which I think goes right the way back to what John was saying at the beginning. That, that is the big modern idea behind religion, is the ability, or behind the debate about religion and modernity, is the ability to be able to choose your own faith. Thank you. Okay, right. Now, um, we're going to have a bit more time for these two to bash some stuff around, but I just want to introduce two points, maybe, to kick us off, because we've got to eventually get back to religion and the market as well. And uh, I want to consider two articles of faith, one of which you've been through, the other which you've probably touched on but haven't gone into, and, and I think it's the one that bears on the market. The first is uh, what they've been talking about in terms of secularization and the secularization thesis, which I think we can pro helpfully conceive more broadly as a kind of uh, self-understanding of, of modernity or the discourse of modernity. And that would have a very general picture of the development of human societies from a primitive or savage or animal origin heading off towards some kind of... Uh, ultimately civilized human end. So you have the savage human at the beginning and the, um, the civilized human at the end. And the discourse of modernity says that this is a progress, a movement of progress in history in which we're embedded and that our period is the one in which not only have we got rid of certain kinds of uh, superstitions which had already begun to wither away and uh, magic which had begun to wither away but now, in our time, with the development of modern science, modern technology, um, religion too, it seems, probably will wither away. And so we've got to see that uh, secularization thesis is itself embedded in a, a much broader self-understanding, an article of faith here, which is an understanding of the whole movement of humanity in history. In fact, it's a whole conception of history as having this kind of linear movement. That is, as it were, the picture of ourselves that we have that belongs to the secularization thesis. But there's a theological conception which can, has to give some articulation of this understanding and, and of real historical developments, which is a kind of a battle of the giants between God and mammon. And so if you, you can give an interpretation of this movement towards scientific rational modernity and the market in terms of this battle between God and mammon, in which mammon is winning over. And uh, if God is back, the earlier version of that, God is dead, would have been, as it were, the upshot of that battle. God is dead, mammon has won, and all we're left with is the market, and that's why some people have this God hole in them, because they're missing that bit of sort of the spiritual uplifting moment, um, and that we live in a time where all we care about is the price of our houses, or uh, the decrease in the price of our houses, or whatever it is. Um, so there's a theological understanding of this in which the market is given a particular role, and indeed, within the secularization thesis, probably the market would be understood as having a, a, a determining role in terms of um, the proper functioning of a society, society wouldn't be one dominated by um, theological authority or theocratic authority. You have uh, um, what belongs to Caesar remains with Caesar. So we have uh, two professions of faith, a, a discourse of modernity that belongs to the secularization thesis and a discourse of modernity which belongs to a religious elaboration or, or interpretation of that. Um, both of them seem to me to have some view of the market. Uh, on the whole, the classic religious one would have been very hostile to it, but I don't know, perhaps we're moving into a time where religion and the market having a different relationship. Do you want to stop? Well, yes, thank you very much. I'll say two things briefly. I mean, the first, to bring down, I mean, to, in a way, illustrate or exemplify your point about a self-understanding. Um, I had a headmaster once in my youth who used to begin the church services in the school I went to by saying um, he had an irrefutable argument for the existence of God, which was that every morning he got up with such brilliant ideas 
that in a spirit of modesty had to attribute them to God. <laughs> and um, it, oh, it seems to me that there is a, um, uh, um, he couldn't possibly, could he have been so brilliant to think of them himself. And there is a kind of secular version of that, which, is, which says um, there is this kind of, there really must be intellectual progress in history leading to a secular uh, civilization. Uh, it may not be inevitable, it's terribly difficult, there are long periods of darkness, there are appalling periods of religious obscurantism and, and retrogression, but after all that immense struggle, there must such be such a, prog uh, a process of intellectual progress because I exist. I mean, how could I account for myself, secular intellectual, who understands this profound long struggle, looking down at the mountain from the mountaintops at struggling dark humanity? How could I account for myself if there wasn't this magnificent um, uh, ongoing uh, um, uh, um, advance, the march of humanity towards the light? Um, with the assumption that I, the secular intellectual, embodies the light. So that is a sort of profound type of uh, self-understanding, but I guess the, the, the one very simple point I'd make about it, serious point, is that I think the error that was made in the 19th century was to construe particular patterns of secularization in some European countries as if they were universal historical laws. That was the error. And of course, there was an inherent implausibility in that um, because um, the type of religion that existed in Western Europe is only one type of monotheism. It's only one type of religion. It doesn't account for the non-theistic religions and sort of vast diversity of um, religious experience and practice. Uh, but that's, I think, where it roots. In other words, the confusion of a, cont a set of contingent historical developments in parts of Europe over a couple of hundred years with a universal law about modernity. That's, that's where I think the intellectual era involved. It's a bit like if I, uh, um, I was thinking when um, uh, John was talking about a rather delightful story. I think it might be of, of Mazzini, uh, the Italian nationalist. I think, um, uh, anybody who knows the origin of this, because um, I can't remember what year it was, but it said that Mazzini was standing in a, in a crowd in uh, Italy which had gathered to uh, look at um, uh, a cross which had miraculously appeared in the sky. And everyone was looking up at this cross with absolute fascination. And Mazzini stood there for a while and then turned to someone and said, but you know there is no cross. And the person he turned to said, Look, yes, you're right, and walked away. <laughs> and, uh, and I think uh, secularization is like that. Secularization is the cross in the sky. Um, you look up and you see it and everyone sees it. And then someone comes along and says, but you know, there's nothing there. Mm, yeah. Except that there aren't that many people who immediately respond by um, turning away and saying that. Now, what about, what about the religion, religion and the market? Well, of course, you know, if, if you are versed to some limit, to some extent in social theory, you remember Weber and his arguments about the relations between capitalism and Christianity. So it's not generally true that um, Christianity, or certainly not religion, and even um, predominantly anti-market or anti-capitalist religions as Catholicism was for a long time, Roman Catholicism, um, are hostile to the market. There have been types of religiosity and types of religion which have, um, um, so to speak, validated uh, religion virtues of wealth making, Calvinism being an obvious one. And of course, when um, uh, uh, um, John was talking about China, it came to my mind that it's recently been reported, I'm not an expert on this, but re John would know more than I do about it, but it's recently been reported that Calvinism in particular is spreading yeah. quite quickly in China. And there the association, I mean, in other words, one can imagine, I'm not saying this will happen, but it's a possible, it's a, some, it's a thought experiment worth making, that as well as being the predominant capitalist country in the world, as China might very well be, if it already isn't in, uh, uh, in 10 or 20 years. It could also be um, the biggest Christian country in the world in which a type of Christianity, Calvinism, was a strong element. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that will happen because there are many contingencies here, but I think it's not impossible and it's, worth, um, it's, wor it's actually worth um, thinking about. Final point, I guess the background idea, if you ask, what's the intellect, I mean, I agree with, with what John said very much. I mean, I tend to deal with this as a, uh, a development in the history of ideas, but there's a sort of journalistic, a Mazzini point, a journalist looking up and saying, but there's no secularization going on here. Um, I mean, that's an important point, a very, very important point, because the intra-academic debates often ignore 
um, uh, these elements in, 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 in the real world. But if you asked yourself what is, the, as it were, to my mind, the mistake, but if you asked yourself what was the theoretical core of the secularization thesis, it's the argument that what philosopher, it's the argument that religion is what philosophers in the past used to call <coughs> when I did philosophy um, back in the 60s, and it's still used to an epiphenomenon. That's to say, what religion is, it's, 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 it's a series of developments in society which is entirely produced by other phenomena. So the phenomena could be um, uh, poor education, political oppression, inequality, ignorance, stupidity, uh, whatever it might be, fanaticism, wicked priests, whatever. The whole long list of patriarchy uh, uh, poverty, a whole long list of um, causes, and if those causes are removed, since there's nothing else to religion, religion will vanish. That's the background idea that religion is epiphenomenal, and you'll find that in practically all of the evangelical atheists today. If you remove these causes, if you have a world where there's no patriarchy, a world where there's no religious education, a world where there's no uh, oppression, blah, 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 then there'd be no religion. And so I think the core, as it were, of that is 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 in my view, false, and its falsity explains, in a way, it's the deep theoretical explanation of why, as the world gets more modern, that's to say things like it becomes more based on science, people assume that as the world became based, more based on science, religion will be marginalized, hasn't happened. As the world becomes more capitalist, which is also happening still, despite the uh, uh, current uh, collapse of um, um, significant part of the American financial system, um, uh, that religion will, 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 will fade away. As it gets richer, which it might still do at least for a while, the world, none of these assets of modernity have in fact um, removed uh, religion or even made it significantly weaker in most countries. So that's, I think, the key point. Um, I, I was going to comment, well, I was going to give about three, four comments. One was on um, John's point about intellectuals believing that they were so bright that that must be a reason for God to exist. There's a very nice anecdote where Voltaire had this basic theory that all clever people should, shouldn't believe there was a, a God, but he was insistent that he was very, very keen on the idea of, I think it was his servants, and actually, no doubt, at a sexist age, his wife, he was very keen, should believe in God because otherwise it would be utter hell, and he wanted to... Um, so so that there's always been a somewhat split within intellectuals between um, what they actually think is, is right and what they actually need at that precise time. In terms of discourse and modernity, I'd add one further twist to what's already been said. That, that there's one rather difficult thing, which I have to admit, once again, we, we record because it's there, is that within the sort of religions that, were, that, 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 that are growing, if you look around the world, a lot of the ones which are growing are the least intellectual of them all. I mean, the fastest growing religion of the 20th century, even, even allowing for Islam's huge growth, was Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism was founded in the back streets of Los Angeles. Um, it's extremely emotional. It's like, the, I suppose, for those who... Don't, really don't, don't want to go through the full sort of phase, um, uh, theology of it. It's almost like the most American of all religions. Um, you, you, an easy way to describe it is going to watch an exorcism in Brazil where various housewives would come in off the street clutching their, their bags and laundry and children. And then you watch them for about an hour going through absolute hell, I suppose, with, with spirits being cursed out of them. Um, and then at the end, they pick up their... their, their their children, their laundry, um, who've just watched them go through all this um, and, and, and then head off to do more shopping before going around. It, but Pentecostalism went from nobody in 1911 to around 500 million people of some form of charismatic background by the end of, by the, end of the, the 20th century. And there is a sort of problem there, as I think back in the 60s, maybe when John was being taught, there was a general expectation, not just that the world would get more secular, but the sort of religions that would survive would be the kind of clever, Graham Greenish, doubting Catholicism, um, um, some hyper-sophisticated version of Anglicanism. Um, and yet, the numbers, for better or worse, aren't on that side. So I'd throw that, I mean, I, I, we, we look to see whether there was going to come back and that, that doesn't seem to be it. And in terms of the emerging middle classes, they seem to be going quite heavily for, quite, for, for religions which take a, a rather strident attitude on various things. In terms of God and mammon, that was the main thing I want to talk, because I think you'll were correct to be dragged back to the subject. My general evidence is that God and Mammon, if they ever were in opposition, I think they were in opposition substantially in the Catholic Church for a long time, now they're working amazingly well together. Um, you know, if you look at the world at the moment, 
I think you can almost reduce it, and I apologize for the simplicity, to sort of supply and demand. You have demand for religion being stirred up by globalization. Um, demand both in sense of some people turning to religion as a sort of storm shelter against, um, uh, against the onrush of modernity as people see it. I think you could certainly see that in some parts of the Islamic world. You see people deeply worried about what's happening outside and clutching towards religion. Um, there's a famous comment which Obama said perhaps tactlessly about people, people hanging on to the, their churches in these times. But I think much more so, and that's the bit which, again, people tend to stress, much more so the evidence from around the world to me was that the other bit of demand very much is not coming from people who are frightened um, by globalization, but people who see religion as a way to get further ahead in it, um, religion as a way to, 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 to move up, up in the world. You can see that certainly in the Indian middle classes who, who flocked to the BJP somewhat moved away recently, but in terms of um, Hinduism, you can see it in terms of what happened in Turkey um, with the, the, the new, new AK party. That, you know, these are not people, th these are the clever bourgeoisie, exactly the people who Nehru and Ataturk wanted to create, and yet they have spun back towards religion. And I think in that respect, again, I think there is a model in America. You go to the mega churches of America, they are not cited in poor, miserable parts of America. They are cited in the prosperous suburbs. You wander into a mega church and you see rows upon rows of white, but also black and Hispanic and Asian, middle class, upwardly mobile Americans gathered in the mega churches. And these are people who see religion as part of that modernity. They see absolutely no real contrast between making money and that. The, the war between God and mammon on that side is not there. And again and again and again, even again in the house church in China, the house church in China, I described at the beginning of the book, the people there are a stem cell scientist, two professors, about five or six international businessmen. You know, these are not people who are somehow being cowered by the world back into religion. They're people who are willingly going for it. And again and again and again, if you look at the social sciences at the moment, it is split between one group of people who are keen to prove ever more that, that, that God didn't exist, which is supposed to be one element of, of Dawkins, but the other half is people actually trying to measure why, scientists in some ways trying to measure why faith is there, why we are such theotropic um, creatures. And so you see a huge amount of experiments into why exactly religious people are healthier, wealthier, and even be slightly brighter by some measures with sort of nuns being put into MRI machines to measure how they pray, <laughs> and various odd things involving um, um, Buddhists as well. But wh whichever way you look at it, the demand side of religion is going quite well. But I'd also point out that the, the supply side, which again I think has slight American origins, is also being put, you know, if the demand is there, you'll now see more and more people willing, again outside Western Europe, where you have the curse of established religion, I think in this respect, you, you see ever more people trying to supply it. You, you go and visit, again, the big mega churches in America. They, they have every version of market segmentation one could, one could dream up. They have Bibles for tweens, for teens, for people in camouflage, for children below the age of, they come in every available color, they come in rap versions, they come in every single, um, I think it's low that I walk through the valley of death. You um, they, they walk through the hood, you are always on my side. Um, there, there are a variety of things for every single occasion. This is a, a people who are segmenting, although they hate this phraseology, they, they are segmenting their market for religious consumers time and time again. And this, I think, more than perhaps in any previous time, I think mammon and God are basically more aligned than they have been, whether, again, whether we like it or not. So that's, that would be my side on that. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to... Uh one of the moments in John Gray's comments when early on, John, you said that um, the secularist politics of the 19th, 20th century had, had, was bust, as it were, the, the Marxism and so on. Um, one of the features of that sort of politics, as you went on to say, was its sort of progressism, the idea that there was this progress in history and that one could also call a kind of secular theodicy, because mm -hmm. theodicies had always said that all this terrible stuff that happens and continues to happen will be 
um, will be justified in the end when, when we reach the end. And so you have these sort of theodicial conceptions of human history, often with a kind of hidden hand. The Jacobin side, as it were, has an unhidden hand. It's our hand and we'll make it happen. And I was wondering whether when you were talking about the financial crisis we've been, we are in at the moment, whether that would be a crisis for a certain kind of modern theodicy, which would be of a, a sort of a financial markets kind, the, 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 the uh, Smith, Adam Smith hidden hand, as it were, that there would have been some idea that, okay, no, it's not human activity which will reach that great end uh, by trying to produce it. We just get on with economic activity and it will come. Mm. Um, has that bl been blown out of the water now as well, do you think? Both of you. I think so. I once sort of I once suggested in a meeting, a business meeting, that um, maybe the hedge hedge fund should be set up to invest in small and undervalued religions, and uh, uh, went on to suggest a, a hedge fund focusing on virtue, you know, and um, possibly even one um, uh, could do pretty well if it invested in hypocrisy. But um, <laughs> unfortunately, they thought I was joking, so I didn't get anywhere. Uh, but to be more serious uh, about this. Um, I think that in what you've just um, said, there is a, a, a very important point which also came out in what John Micklethwaite said, which is I think the decline of progressive secular belief systems has not been followed and will not be followed in most parts of the world. Whatever I, I mean, I'm not identifying my views with this development, but I'm just saying it will not be followed by a collapse in the belief in progress. It will be followed by the growth of religions which see themselves as progressive. Mm. That's to say the secular uh, um, uh, hope, which has vanished um, uh, nearly everywhere with, from Mar with the collapse of Marxism and communism, which I think is on the retreat, at least with respect to the more militant forms of liberalism, secular liberalism, uh, that, that retreat won't be followed by, as it were, uh, religions of um, Pascalian religions or Graham Greenish religions of um, self-indulgent darkness and gloom um, about um, dying uh, slowly in some remote foreign part but discovering tremendous depths of spirituality as you do. Um, it, on the contrary, the types of religion which are flourishing and thriving are ones which are um, very hopeful. They're ones which embrace these um, phenomena of globalization uh, and, and embrace them in order to do well in them. So that's an important point, which is that the, the, the as it were, the, if you think of the neoliberal belief system, and I think there was such a thing, it's rather, we're now in a situation, by the way, it's rather like when communism collapsed. For the first few years after the collapse of communism, you couldn't find a single person in the entire world who'd ever believed in it. Or rather not a neoliberalism. People said, no such thing, never was. Absolutely not, it's all nonsense, being invented by uh, critics of it and so on. Well, there was, I think. And in fact, I mean, people like um, uh, Greenspan say there was because he said he believes in it. And he doesn't anymore, so he says. Um, uh, so I think there was such a thing. And I think that kind of, that maybe was not the last, because maybe there'll still be others, but was the most recent, the latest, um, secular theodicy, that's to say, a kind of redemptive hum view of human history in largely secular terms. That's gone, won't come back in our time, I don't think in any strong political way anyway, though there are small bands of believers in their bunkers who still right-wing think tanks and so on still hold to it, just that there are small bunkers of Trotskyists here and there uh, um, who, who hold to it. Um, but what we have instead is a mass, a series of mass developments are these religions, Calvinism and others, uh, forms of American Protestant Pentecostalism and elsewhere, which are not only very emotional, but on the whole, very favorable to mammon mm. and very favorable to modernity and all of its works. So that's a very interesting development. In other words, the collapse of secular hope has not been followed, and I don't think will be followed by any general condition of despair or pessimism or, or whatever. Mm. It'll be followed by religions which are more hopeful. Okay. And it is being followed. <clears throat> I do, on the basic issue of whether, whether the kind of downfall of capitalism, which Lisa, I fiercely dispute, um, <laughs> is gonna have an effect on this, um, the, the, I'll, I went to go and see Rick Warren, who's the big American um, um, sort of mega preacher, 
and he claims to me that during previous recessions, um, the things which always do well in, in, in recessions are bars, movie theaters, and um, churches. And I, sus I suspect it's possible, just concentrating on America, because it's it, just to give one particular place, or, or say the West generally, it, it's, I could argue it both ways. One argument would be that people who lose their jobs, um, whose lives suddenly are thrown into complete turmoil, that is a somewhat of an Obama moment. It's where people suddenly begin to question exactly what track they were on before, and they begin to look for the, for the, for, for the I suppose, the meaning of life. They begin to question what they're, they're up to, and that pushes them towards religion. And to that extent, I think capitalism was, you know, certainly the last period, was one where there were so many gains to be had from other um, versions of isms that that got in the way. Uh, a slightly contrarian argument, but sometimes I, I, it strikes me. I should say that I, I was interviewing Warren whilst he, he was baptizing 4,000 people who'd shown up when he only expected 300, I think, showed um, um, uh, how, 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 at least from his angle, it seemed to be working. The, the other argument is uh, actually the other way around, is that some people have had the luxury and time to go and um, uh, consider their inner selves and now suddenly they won't. The time which they used to put aside um, towards going to church or going to the mosque or going to, um, th that actually will now be based much more heavily on, on the need to do things right now to solve their immediate concerns. I tend to think the former is correct. Um, in terms of progressive secular beliefs, I, I slightly temper what I said earlier in terms of, um, yes, you know, Pentecostalism is amazingly emotional, but John's absolutely right. It, they, they, these are very optimistic religions. That's the bit which a lot of these ones which are doing well conveys. And I think there is a tiny, um, tiny evidence of softening in some respects. Again, if you look at Warren, who I suppose now is the world, he certainly, um, he's a man who sold 18 million books before getting his first review, which is something which both John and I can hope for. Um, <laughs> he's now sold 30, 30 million copies of The Purpose Driven Life, again, something which we aspire to somewhat. Um, it, it's quite interesting, if he is the new leader of religious America, and I think it's quite clear that he is, he is a much softer version of what we used to think of as American religion than the people who were in sway for quite a lot of Bush's reign. Now, this is somebody who, yes, is against gay marriage and against abortion, but actually spends most of his time talking about things like climate change, the environment, um, helping the third world, a huge amount of evidence on, on poverty and stuff like that. So I think within it, there's an element whereby these, the, the, the angry versions of religion, to some extent, do burn themselves out. I was going to just put up one thing for progressive secular beliefs. I, I think when you look at those intellectuals we talked about earlier, and, and very much in our book we go back to this foundation of the, these two huge revolutions. You have the American Revolution and the French Revolution. The French Revolution profoundly you know, saw the church as part of the Ancien Regime, and whilst nicking some of the church's ideas, did everything possible to get rid of the clergy, and that, that stayed very much within, the sort of, within our tradition. In America, it just wasn't that way. America, as John said, was not a very religious place before the revolution. That is an absolute myth. You know, we think of America as being a Puritan, founded by Puritans. It was, but shortly afterwards, a lot less savory people of the sort who we then um, happened to transport to Australia were sent across to America. And so before the revolution, in America, if you, look at the, if you read the people of bishops and things going around, they basically, some of them said it was worse than Europe. Others said it's a bit better. There was slightly more face in the sense that there was more diversity, but in all other respects, it wasn't different to Europe. What made it different was what the, what the people did, what the founders did, which again goes to this idea of religion and the market, is that they opened up um, they, by, by the First Amendment saying there should be no official faith, and the dividing church from state, they actually opened up this huge market in religion, and the Methodists who had such a diff sort of relatively difficult time here trying to work out how to deal with the established church, arrived in America and converted an eighth of the, of, the, of the country within a generation. And since then, American religion, and actually I would argue other versions of religion around the world, have just seen this repetitive series of waves. And that was very much where it came from. But those original progressive secular beliefs, some of them, I think, were, were legitimate. People, if you look at the people, very much in the founders' minds, very much in the French, the, the, the intellectuals by the French Revolution, they came from an era where the wars of religion, you know, which wiped out huge numbers of Europeans, 
these were seen as sort of like the evil attic and the evil aunt in the attic. In the same way as we look back on the Second World War, the, the, these were things which were very live in their, in their brains. So one, they saw religion as very dangerous, and two, they were preoccupied by what to do with it in the society. And actually, to some extent, you could argue there's an element, I think, now, and this is where I was sticking up for progressive secular beliefs, is that I think there's an element where by some aspects of that, of not worrying about the bad sides of religion, th those are things which actually, again, perhaps in America, people need to concentrate on more. Okay, John, thanks very much. Um, we've now got some time for your questions. We're going to take them in threes, and if possible... Oh, okay, some of you can go. Uh, <laughs> we're going to take them in threes. and. Um, if possible, please keep them brief. And I'm afraid I'm a very unforgiving, Chair, and I, these guys have to be polite. I'm, I don't. So just um, keep it brief or you'll get interrupted. So uh, hands up, and we've got mics, if you just wait for the microphone. Because one right at the back over there, and then one right at the back over there. We've got a third one who wants to put their hand up. There's one at, have we got a mic at the top? Yeah, and then the one at the top there. OK. One, two. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. All right. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to understand myself. To what extent do new policies, such as on uh, on uh, euthanasia, on abortion, and probably on uh, on, uh, on and probably on uh, on homosexuality issues, have to do with the current attempts to push ahead secular views? Thank you. And over there. Um, I was wondering um, if, uh, in a globalized world, religions are imagined as being in competition, um, is there also potential for t mergers? Um, <laughs> my, if we think of Christianity, Islam, rabbinical Judaism as products of the globalized world of imperial Rome, imperial uh, of the caliphate, uh, what future religions might we get from uh, 21st century globalization. Thank you, very good. And up there. Thank you. Uh, if, if, if you see this partnership between God and Mammon, uh, wouldn't you think instead that uh, is, Mammon is disguising as God and, and actually doing a wonderful job on his own thinking that there is such partnership? <laughs> well, that wonderfully brief, all three of them. Let's see how you guys do. Well, I'll take the one about takeovers and religious takeovers. And uh, um, what I think it would, and I think it is a serious question because the history of religion has been a history of hybridization. Religions haven't uh, um, been entirely separate. They've cross-fertilized. Um, and I think that will probably go on. So I, I, I imagine, I mean, there's some evidence of this already. Uh, there are, I mean, there's such a thing as American Buddhism, distinct from other Buddhisms in other parts of the world. It has various different forms, some of them closer to Judaism or Christianity or to secular humanism. And I think that will go on, and I think that's rather good. I mean, that wouldn't be something new if it went on. Um, religions have always been like that. I mean, they may insist on exclusivity, but in actual fact, there's an, always an immense amount of hybridization. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll join quickly on the, the religion, the competitive takeovers. I, I agree with John completely. That's, that, that's the way it's always been. I, I'd merely say that the slight element whereby you employ, the, 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 the element which says um, religions should sort of merge and, and become sort of vaguer if that, if that was part of it, I think most of the evidence at the moment is, and I'm sorry to use the corporate language, but given what we say behind us, we might as well do it. The, the, Strong brands count for a, a, great, a great amount. And I think you could argue that one of the problems of the Church of England at the moment is the lack of a strong brand um, that, that in the quote-unquote spiritual marketplace. I've had this conversation with Rowan Williams. It's not always gone well. But, the, but there, there, is, there, is, there is that there is that element. You know, if you stand for something clearly, then that seems to work. It doesn't... And, it, and what's happening at the moment is people... Again, I say America is the starting point, but you can see it around... The, lots of other areas, Pe people are picking and choosing between religions. It, it, the quintessential American, um, when it came to religion, was actually Jefferson, who went through the Bible and cut out all the bits he didn't like, um, all the bits he did like, I can't remember which way around it was, um, and then decided he'd keep those bits or throw away. <laughs> and that's, that people, there's an element of consumer-led stuff, and, and uh, again, very visible in America, a you know, quarter of Americans have changed their faith. And you, and you could push that number up to 44% if you jump between different versions of that. That's a lot. People, people are, and, and, and I think it's incredibly significant. 
because the more that people choose their faith, the more that it becomes that something, you know, people choose almost as much when they're 25 as opposed to when they're two, sort of five hours old. That, that, that's going to make a huge difference to politics this century. I think that's, that's something which people are just beginning to, to gather in. People, if people are choosing their faith, they're not going to leave that faith behind when they go into the ballot box. They're not going to leave that faith behind perhaps when they go to work, and it's going to be difficult. Um, to what extent um, do, do, do the new policies of uh, euthanasia, abortion, and so on make a difference? I think there's an element in terms of Europe's attempts. There was a bad element of Europe's attempts to exclude religion from the, from the, from the public square, which was, which was just they didn't like it. Um, there was, however, this bit of, you know, about the, the, the worries that religion is dangerous because it makes all disputes much worse, and it's certainly true of the culture wars. I think there's an element whereby one of the things which is pulling, and this goes right the way back to the argument about modernity, one of the things which is bringing religion back into the public square, again, whether we like it or not, is science now. Science, science used to be something which was a wonderful tool for kind of pushing religion out. Now suddenly you have cloning, all those sort of debates. I think those are reawakening deep issues within people about who we are, what, which tends to push people towards religion. Um, in terms of mammon disguised as God, um, I think you, you, that's a sort of reference to the idea of, um, of, of big business behind, behind, the sort of, um, behind a kind of godly element. There's two bits of that. One, religion is big business. You know, the, the, it's, it's impossible to ignore. It has... If you look at religion as a business, which we do in one chapter, you, you, you know, particularly American religion again, you, you know, it has its own clusters, it has its own Silicon Valleys, it has its own versions of you know, centers of excellence. Nashville is a place where they produce a lot of the publishing. Colorado Springs is where they have a lot of the politics. It, it employs a, a lot of people. I was about to say a hell of a lot of people, but that might be a Freudian slip. <laughs> it employs close to two, you know, we, we stopped counting somewhere near two million. It's, it's a huge business. It, we, we just, it just, and yes, it may sound too business-like. You know, you go to Philadelphia, a billion dollars worth of social services are provided by religious people. That, that, so it does have that side. But again, I counsel that, you, uh, certainly in Europe, we tend to have this vision of the huckster televangelist the modern ones t tend not to be like that. I think that they are much more serious. Yes, they use all these modern business methods, but on the whole, they are not, um, you know, they're not people who are creaming it all off and heading off with mistresses to Mexico. Or if they, if they did, I didn't meet them. Okay, we've got a couple more questions coming in. Yes, okay, so one at the front, another just behind, and then one at the top, at the back. Do you think uh, the current world ec economic crisis is God's idea of a practical joke? <laughs> Thank you. Bearing in mind that sec secular society is meant to sort out the world's problems and it's meant to be progressive and the world wars that we've had and the economic crisis that we're currently in sort of maybe suggests that possibly that's not true. Okay. Thank you. You can give it over there. That's <coughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> I, was, um, I was struck that um, until just the last comment that we'd heard nothing about scientific truth. I mean, there are two developments going on here as well. There is the growth of an American base, if you like, scientific community around the world. And these, this sociological phenomenon you're talking about um, in growth of religions, um, I suppose they come together in conflict in things like opposition to stem cell research. Um, and it's very interesting there that it was religion that finally retreated in America, not the scientific community. Uh, and I'm wondering whether, in fact, we've got two phenomena going here which are not actually colliding. They're, they're sliding over each other. On the one hand, there is a continuing growth of scientific, if you like, skepticism uh, and uh, a, a deep public belief in scientific technological progress, particularly in medicine. Uh, on the other hand, you have this huge phenomenon, which is, as you yourself said, I think, largely at the less educated level of society, which is also progressing. Um, would you like to comment on that? Okay, and up there. Um, I think a phenomenon in the financial market, specifically over the past decade, is the emergence of Islamic finance. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on coming out of the current recession. How do you think the relationship between financial instruments and uh, religion may evolve. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, I'll, I'll answer the question which I thought, um, which stirred the most, th uh, stirred my own thoughts the most, which is the one about religion and science. Because um, certainly the simple notion of an opposition, either an intellectual opposition or a, um, a sociological opposition, hasn't been borne out. Because if you thought that the more society was committed and brilliant in scientific research and development, the less it would be religious, then America would falsify that, wouldn't it? So uh, there isn't a kind of any kind of simple um, 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 conflict there. I think also, though, John might want to comment on this as well, he didn't say that the um, that it was a general truth that religion was coming from the less educated. Indeed, in the case of yeah. China, it was included the more highly educated or even the most highly educated. So um, I think uh, including scientists. So I think we need to distinguish between the practice of science and a certain type of scientific worldview, which is roughly speaking the worldview of 19th century positivism, an enormously powerful movement in the 19th century, which not only, for example, many of the p people who built canals were positivists. The man who built um, uh, the Suez Canal was a positivist, but many of them thought of canals the way people later thought of um, railways, and people now think about the internet. When the world is covered by canals, there will be no more war. When the world is covered by canals, there'll be no more religion. There'll only be people like us, canal builders. Um, uh, and uh, internet uh, types, that's all there'll be. Um, and so that was very, very strong. It was enormously, it had a tremendous effect, not just on Mill, but George Eliot was a the rather brilliant, I think, wonderful English writer, was a st strongly influenced by positivism. There were positivist churches, there still are in Brazil. There's a positivist slogan on the Brazilian flag, order through progress, or progress through order. Mr. Brown might want to consider that. Um, and, and so, I mean, seriously, I think there isn't any simple, at the level of history, I would say not at the level, I mean, I'm not a believer myself, I should say, in any religion, I don't practice any or, believe, or subscribe to any, but I don't think there's any simple contradiction at the intellectual level, that's a different argument, but sociologically and historically, it's quite clear that the relations between science and religion are extraordinarily complex and that they cross-fertilize each other. And also, a very important point, that with the arrival of modern science in early modern periods, religion, for the first time, started to cast itself in part in the form of theories. If you go back to the old Christian and the old Jewish view of um, the Genesis story, it was explicitly said time and time again that it was a myth or a way of, or poetry, or a way of accessing truths that were otherwise unsaid. It was not philosophy or theory. It's only when you get into the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries that you get what we now talk about design arguments, Paley, early types of creationism and so on. So religion has sort of modeled itself on science, at least as much as seeing itself as, you know, for the big reason, being threatened by science. And I would also argue myself from my own work on this that within science there have been many crypto-religious projects, actually, which are closely... So it's very complicated. So, I mean, that's all I would say. And I think it's the complexity and cross-fertilization one has to get at not any simple idea of opposition, because historically speaking, it just doesn't hold water. On, on, on God's idea of a practical joke, I think that the underlying point is that we, we don't need religion for things to go horrifically wrong. Um, even when we were worried about wars of, wars of religion, we managed to have you know, endless amounts of... We have a large part of his book looking at wars of religion around the world. But it's worth pointing out that it, it's possible still to have places like um, North Korea without it, or indeed um, capitalism going wrong. Um, in terms of the scientific truth, again, I, I, I think you may have misinterpreted it. For better or worse, and, you know, the argument, the, the evidence is very clear. The people rushing to religion, there, there is one group who are less well-educated, but you know, who, who see it as a storm shelter. But in country after country, it's actually the prosperous people who are running to it. Again, Western Europe, a slight exception. But everywhere else, it's the more modern and clever and wealthier and healthier they get, the more religious they're likely to be. You might argue, some people might argue the, the, the link is the other way around. Um, on your point about science, though, it's interesting, which is an interesting way in which history has changed. Somebody pointed me out, out of the, the major religions in Africa, only one doesn't have any problem with all these skeletons which keep on appearing, which are about sort of 30,000 years old or 60,000 years old. And that, bizarrely, uh, long time after Galileo, is Catholicism. They're the only ones which are completely happy with the idea of 
a world which didn't begin 6,000 years ago. And you can go to a rather amazing place in Kentucky called the Creation Museum, which I think deals with the idea that man was created exactly 6,005 years ago. And so, but because it's also run by scientists, unbelievably, um, they, they, they have to crack in a lot of things like the dinosaurs and so on, all before the advent of Judea. So you go almost from Adam and Eve quickly to the dinosaurs, in and out. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing place. On the question about Islamic finance, um, I'm going to use, yes, Islamic finance has done, has done quite well. I, I'm going to use that as a springboard because it strikes me the one question. We haven't actually talked a lot about Islam and Islam's relation to modernity, which I think is, is crucial. I think that the increase of Islamic finance shows to me two things. One, it shows the difficulty Islam has with dealing with the modern world in, to some extent. And it, and it is, that there's a big sort of debate going on at the moment about whether Islam is going to go through a reformation of its own sort. Is it going to have its own version of an enlightenment and things like that? It, 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 Islam is different it's, it, it, in, in some ways. And I, I say that without any sense of pejorative comment. You, the, the, Christianity is more adaptive, partly to the extent that it's, it's founded by somebody who himself um, was not a lawgiver. You know, he was effect effectively something of a, of, a, of a misfit, or that was the way he appeared. And it's not founded by somebody who was himself a ruler and was setting down precise rules. It's not run by the Quran, which is meant to be the precise word of God, rather than something interpreted by later people. It's, it's generally harder for Islam to find room to deal with these things, for better or worse. Um, that, that would be the, the, the negative side to do with Islam dealing with modernity. And, and our, general, our general suspicion, which is completely against the evidence of the past century, is that actually Christianity will probably do better than Islam over the next, um, the, over the next century, because it's more comfortable with pluralism. That, that, that's the sort of bad side. The good side would be, I think Islamic finance is a good example of Islam finding ways around it. And, and one particular thing which interests me is that you know, the bits of Islam which are doing best at coping with the modern world in some ways are the bits outside the Arab heartlands. And I think there's strong elements if you're going to look at what could happen to Islam, perhaps. I think you, you, you do want to look at Western Europe. You want to look at America, where the, you know, the very obviously in places like Detroit, you, um, you, see, you see big changes. You want to look at Indonesia and Turkey. It's just possible, if you look at the Catholic Church, the, the Vatican II was actually sponsored in large part, or a lot of the intellectual heft for it actually came from an American Catholic who was keen to see Catholicism compete heavily in the, the particular American bishop. It's possible you could imagine that some kind of similar effect would happen, happen in Islam from somebody, from a, from a prelate of, of, who was based outside the main Arab heartlands. Um, that goes against the whole Wahhabi thing in the Saudis. But anyway, it's, there's, there's an issue. I've, I've used it to tail off into another religion to cause more angst. Um, we've had a number of points made here about the compatibility of religion with pluralism mm. and the importance of that as we move forward. And one of, I'm sure a number of you will have seen an article this week by Ophelia Benson entitled, Does God Hate Women? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you look at the world religions, and perhaps this bench or even this audience, um, there is a certain predominance of men. Uh, and that's also true in the questions. And I just wondered if there are any women who will put their hands up. One up there, one over there, and one at the back. Okay, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is not a question about religion and feminism, perhaps unfortunately, but going back to the title of this lecture, I was just wondering if you could comment at all on any more anti-capitalist manifestations of religion, such as uh, the liberation theology of the Jesuits in Central and Southern America and some kind of left-wing Shiite groups in Sunni-dominated countries. Thank you. Down here, up here, sorry. Um, my question actually was, was about women. I was just um, wondering that if, as you say, if religion is on the rise, um, what implications that has for, for women's kind of economic emancipation. Because obviously in some ways religion can be a force for equality and justice, but obviously um, certain strands of certain religions have fairly kind of traditional and even kind of repressive views about women and, you know, in their role in the marketplace and in the, the world in general. Thank you. And um, where was the other one? Yeah. yeah. 
I should have a dog collar on, but I didn't like to. Um, he said, John Micklethwaite said that the angry tendency in religion is burning itself out. I think I'm quoting you correctly. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to think that was true, but have you not found, uh, I'm thinking of Christianity in this country, there is an angry tendency. Um, I've had a young man say to me, perfectly seriously, that Christians are persecuted in this country now. You can go to prison for being a Christian. And I'm hearing that from all across the social classes as well. Thank you. Okay, last question then. Um, well, if what um, John has argued about religion embracing modernity is true, and I think on the whole it is, putting aside whether it will be an American type of modernity, then I would think that in response to the question about women, religion will inexorably, most religions in most places, will be associated with um, promoting the position of women, at least to the degree that it's already been promoted. That's to say, um, that's part of modernity in most parts of the world. Uh, and it is happening, I think, to some extent. Now, but it's also true to go back to this other question. There are, I mean, I'm not, since I'm not a believer, I don't belong to any congregation, I'm speaking from outside here. But there are strong angry tendencies, uh, even angry paranoid tendencies. That's to say they see secular institutions and, I mean, uh, the British state, um, I think the British state is far more likely to lose all your details than it is to persecute you for, for your beliefs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I think there are these tendencies, particularly, I mean, there are strong, intense conflicts we all know within Anglicanism and some of the communions on issues of uh, gay priesthood, of gay sexuality, of the position of women and so on. So that's all going on. But the fact that they go, it's going on so intensely tells you something. It tells you that these issues are not easily resolved in the church and might even lead to schisms and, uh, and, and so forth. I just want, before I end, because it's directly connected with this, to make my comment on what I see as the chief danger, because uh, it's directly related to the question, this question which was asked about the angry tendency. Um, the chief danger of the resurgence of religion that I focus on, there may be others, is that it, a rebirth of identity politics. Identity politics in the 20th century was normally um, uh, national and racial and it's important to recognize that the racial identity politics in its very worst forms, the Nazi forms, was distinguished by its claim to be science. I mean, that's to say, if you read what they said and what they thought they were doing, they were drawing on a tradition of what they called racial science, which actually was a 19th century British tradition to some extent. It wasn't only old-fashioned types of prejudice. So that was identity politics in the in the, in the 20th century. And I guess I, the, the risk I see, particularly in a time of economic dislocation, when lots of people are getting suddenly worse off for reasons they can't understand, is that um, what was, I mean, if you think, religion didn't always be a matter of identity. I'm, I'm thinking uh, of what um, P.G. Woodhouse said when at the end of his life he was asked whether he had any religious beliefs, not what his religious beliefs were, by the way, but Mr. Woodhouse, do you have any religious beliefs? And this is, I suppose, Anglicanism of an old kind at its most transcendental. He said, frightfully hard to tell, you know. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that kind of response, which I think is rather wonderful in certain ways, is gone now. It's impossible. Because being a Christian or being a Christian of a certain type or being an atheist or being, etc., being Muslim, it's an assertion of identity. And I think the, um, the risk is that when things get rough, that identity is not only become issues of choice and pluralism, they become issues of uh, projection of identities onto other people. And uh, uh, that's dangerous uh, when an identity is projected by one person or one group on another group. It's hardly ever auspicious for the group that has the identity projected on it. In fact, historically speaking, it's quite often been fatal. Um, and, so, and so I think that's the main danger that I perceive, the rebirth of identity politics, which was a pretty much of a curse in the 20th century. John. Okay, very quick. Um, uh, liberation theology, it, it, there, there are some elements where it could come back, I think. The, 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 you've, 
it, it's definitely out of fashion in Latin America, is the old thing, is it's been driven out. Um, the Pentecostals have very much taken the other attitude, and the Catholics have, have, have swung behind them. I think there is some element, definitely within the Catholic Church, of, of some element of the, the, the sort of celebration of the poor, that they've, the, the, the element of workers' rights you could see beginning to come back in, but I don't see much. You do, you do see some elements of anti-capitalism um, in terms of, for instance, little evidence in Turkey, for instance, people can cross with it and stuff. Uh, women, you know, the amazing thing on, on, on women is, that I, I was going to say, is that if you, my experience of having wandered around the world for three, four years looking at different forms of religion, religion is driven by women. I mean, it's, it's particularly Christianity, absolutely. If you, look at, if, you look at, if you look at what's happening in China now, I said it was like what's happened in ancient Rome. It, it's not just because the government is following, from its point of view, possibly a suicidal policy in terms of promoting it. But it's because it's spread by women. It's the, 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 the women are the ones who, 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 who pull people in. It's the women who, on the whole, the most common prayer in China's house churches, somebody told me, is for a husband. And the second one is for a better husband. <laughs> um, <coughs> the, the, and, and you wander around Latin America, the, pe the, people, you know, the people driving, and, and, and actually even to some extent even with Islam, but, but less so, the people driving religion at the moment are, 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 are women. Against that, you have the obvious point that some religions, including, you certainly argue, both Catholicism and Islam, don't give um, women the role they could do. In terms of anger, I do actually share John's big worry about identity pol politics. If you look at some areas of Britain, one of, one of the odd bits of statistics is if you ask people whether they're Christians or not, that we, as opposed to the general lousy reactions in most places, you're tending to get slightly better reactions, and I use the word better probably ironically, in areas where there are a lot of Muslims, you begin to see people re-identifying themselves as Christians. Um, and, and that, I think, is possibly unhealthy. I would merely say that I, I think we possibly, throughout the course of this evening, have been somewhat kind to religion. I mean, you know, it's worth noting that if you, if you worry about um, a war to end the world um, at the moment, you, I think you have, from putting on my geopolitical hat, I think you have four real big things to worry about. One is Israel-Palestine, another is um, Pakistan-India, another is the conflagration of Iran-America-Israel, and the last is North Korea. And it's worth noting that only one of those four um, is a strictly secular dispute, which is North Korea, and that is, the, I suppose, the world we live in. And so, yes, we've celebrated a lot of the plus things about a religion coming back, but there are, there are severe problems. Um, which both John and I in different guises and different times have, have, have encountered. Just to uh, confirm the strangeness of uh, Britain and its religion, 71% of Britons in 2001 declared themselves Christian, 34% believe in God. Now, uh, <laughs> we've been reminded um, of the importance of uh, strong branding. And just to tell you, this was the Forum for European Philosophy event with John Micklethwaite and Professor John Gray. I'm Simon Glendinning. Thank you very much. Thank you.